Welcome to This Week in Hearing and our special series, uh, Giants in Audiology. Hello, I'm Bob Trainer, your host for this episode. And today my guest is Dr. Michael Valente, Professor Emeritus, Department of Otolaryngology, Washington University School of Medicine, St. Louis, Missouri. Dr. Valente is best known for, for his work in the whole field of audiology, but specifically in hearing, hearing rehabilitation, and one of my interests, practice management. Thanks for being with us today, Mike. We really appreciate getting to know you better and your unique and truly inspirational journey uh, to a highly successful career in our profession. Well, thank you so much, Bob. It's an honor uh, to do this. Uh, as, I, as I said to you before, I don't consider myself a giant in audiology, but it's nice that you recognize me as such. Well, you know, some some people said, well, you know, I'm only five, six. So how can I be a giant in audiology? You know, but uh, anyway, uh, thanks for being with us. And I always like to read the professional bio biographical sketch for each and every giant that appears with us. Uh, so here we go with uh, with Mike's biographical uh, orientation. Michael Valenti is Professor Emeritus of Clinical Audiology at Washington University School of Medicine in St. Louis University and was there for 34 years directing the Division of Adult Audiology. In that position, Mike was active uh, in the clinic and directed the Hearing Aid Research Laboratory taught graduate courses in amplification, and a very important innovative area called business component of audiology. He received his PhD from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign in 1975. His interests include spending time with his beautiful wife, Maureen, daughters, uh, Anne and Michelle, and some grandkids by the name of Noah, and Salem and Lumen. And again, thanks so much for being with us, Mike. And, and I understand you kind of kind of started off in the New York City area, like uh, Brooklyn or someplace, you know, one of those places that people from the West never <laughs> understand. You know, that's almost like another country to us. So here we are. Anyway, you can tell us a little bit about uh, about growing up in Brooklyn and, uh, and some of the other uh, things that uh, went along with that. Sure. Well, I was born almost 76 years ago on uh, February 1st, 1948 uh, at Kings County Hospital, which is in uh, the eastern part of Brooklyn. And uh, I have a at the at that moment, I had two older brothers and an older sister, all of which luckily are still alive. So I must have some relatively good genes. <laughs> I uh, as you'll find out in a few minutes, my my background is a little bit different. And some of my memories of my youth uh, are really as uh, stories told through my my siblings and also some research I've done online. And I also had a, another sibling who passed away at nine months from pneumonia. And then I had another sibling who passed away stillborn. So it was a rather large family. Uh, my mother was a Native uh, American uh, living in, in Brooklyn, and my father had immigrated from Portugal. And what makes that interesting is uh, he never spoke English, and so he spoke Portuguese. So I never in uh, at three, I, I was removed from the family and placed in an orphanage. So for my first three years of life, we lived in a rather poor section in an apartment on Alabama Avenue in Brooklyn. And I remember it uh, only because it was a dark hallway and the entrance to the apartment was in the bottom of a staircase. And I even remember, you know, the sense of the smell of urine in the hallway. So oh, it wasn't a yeah. So it wasn't exactly, you know, living in the life of luxury. And I spent three years there never realizing that I never actually spoke to my father because he spoke Portuguese. And obviously at zero to three, uh, I didn't speak Portuguese. And the only person who learned to speak Portuguese was my older brother, so my communication with my father was through my brother. 
I never had a direct communication. And so my mother was a housewife. My father was uh, slightly disabled. He was a he worked in a bakery doing some kind of job. And then something happened and I never quite understood what. But at the age of three, my sister and I were removed from uh, our home and placed in an orphanage in Far Rockaway. And we spent five years there uh, from the age of three to eight for myself. And when people hear that you spend time in an orphanage, you know, the, the immediate reaction usually is, oh, my God, horrible. And, you know, those kinds of connotations. But actually, it was really five excellent years of living Uh the the staff was wonderful. I had a million and one other friends, both male and female. Uh, we were fed well. Uh, it was a large complex. I remember we walked in the front door and it was like little dormitories on a single level. And you'd walk in and the kitchen was over there uh, right as, as soon as you walked in. And then there was a wall. And then on the back of the wall, we just rose and rose and rose and rose and rose in of beds in several columns, if you will. So each one of the kids got a bed and a nightstand. And then behind that, in another wall on the other end, was where you had the showers and the, and the bathroom and all that little stuff. And I spent five years there from the ages of three to eight. Obviously, I went to elementary school in Far Rockaway. Uh, I, I It was probably at that point of my life, the best part of my life, because it was warm. The staff was welcoming. We had a in-ground swimming pool and all those other lovely things. And then at the age of eight, my sister and I were removed from the fourth, uh, the the, uh, the orphanage, and we were placed uh, in a a foster home uh, on Long Island. And we both spent five years there. Unfortunately, this is in Hicksville, uh, which is on Long Island. It's towards the eastern, the mid, the mid section of Long Island. And unfortunately, uh, that that experience was not nearly as pleasant as the experience that we had in the orphanage. Uh, the family it was, a, a, you know, obviously a mother and a father, and two kids who were our age. And you, you know, you've heard stories of. Forced to kids being mistreated by forced to families. Well, this was it. Uh, it was a, a violent home. Uh, there was a lot of physical abuse. There was some sexual abuse. There was a lot of tormenting uh, because we were forced to kids and not real kids. We wouldn't grow up to be anything. And you know, all those stories you hear. I remember uh, they had money to for us to go to the movie theater and to get ice cream sodas. And we never saw it. It was kept by the parents. I remember having haircuts with a bowl put around my head rather than, you know, sending me to a, a barbershop to get my hair cut. It, it just, you know, the bottom line was it wasn't a healthy environment. And after five years of that, at the age of eight, there was an episode that ended up being quite violent, and my sister and I were removed. My sister went to a foster home in Brooklyn. It was an older couple, and they didn't want to take uh, siblings. So I was placed in another foster home, also in Brooklyn, in the Brownsville section of Brooklyn. And I spent literally you know, the rest of my life with that wonderful family, it was the exact opposite of the family in uh, in Hicksville. The family was wonderful. They had two kids. We moved to Brooklyn. Uh, I spent uh, high school years at Samuel J. Tilden High School for reasons that, uh, if you know, the, the Bedford Stuyve section of Brooklyn is not exactly the most safe section in the world. And so we moved from uh, that back to Long Island into Levittown. And that's where I spent the rest of my years. My claim to fame in Hicksville was that I went to the same high school as Billy Joel. Uh, didn't meet him, but I remembered that, you know, you heard about him. Uh, I had no claim. Piano, did any of that piano stuff kind of kind of come through osmosis by any chance? Uh, uh, I don't think so. Uh, you know, 
He he was quite the t- he never finished high school. You know, he he actually get it, he got his J, his GED later on in life. I didn't know him. He didn't know me. But but that's my only claim to fame in okay. in Hicksville. Uh, and then at Tilden High School, didn't know anybody. Uh, and then I graduated high school. My claim to fame there was I was the youngest one to graduate in my senior year. I was a little 17. Uh, I had and the, the only award I got was the best attendance through high school. And that was about it. Uh, I didn't particularly care for high school. I, I didn't like the idea of people telling me where to go, what to do, what not to do, be it this class at this hour, that class at this hour. And that's just my personality. I did well. I was told that I was bright, but I can't say that I performed well in high school. So when high school was over, you know, you got to make a decision on what do you want to do with your life? Well, a lot of my friends went to college. Because of my performance and lack of confidence, I decided, you know, maybe college is not for me. So I decided to enroll in a junior, uh, in a junior college, a National Community College, uh, a two-year degree. But because I had no money, uh, I paid for it myself. And in those days, uh, it was $5 a credit. So every course took $15. And I stretched it out to three years by working full time during the day and then going to school at night. And doing that, it took me uh, three years to finish that degree. And the jobs that I held were uh, delivering parts for a Dodge. And I did that. I sold men's and women's shoes. And my, 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 my interesting thing about selling men's shoes, it was at a really exclusive men's clothing store on Long Island. And it was right next to or near uh, where they had a place called the Westbury Music Festival, where they had different rock groups come in. And my first concert actually was Sonny and Cher way back when. But what's interesting there is one night I was selling shoes and in walks the five members of The Temptations, because they were giving a concert and somehow their shoes got lost in the shuffle. So I sold each one of the temptations, a pair of black leather, patent leather shoes to go with their tuxedos. I also sold shoes to Telly Savalas, who is known for Kojak. And I also sold shoes to Engelbert Humperdinkle, uh, which <laughs> I was not a big fan of. And then uh, I, other jobs I had was selling women's shoes. And the other thing I did is I sold clothing to men who were extra large, so to speak. And I, in that role, I ended up fitting a large number of the New York Jets who practiced their uh, football on Long Island. And I saw uh, Joe Namath quite a few times uh, and the offensive line of the New York Jets. And then I finished my associate's degree, did very, very well. And I was fortunate enough to land a full-time scholarship to Adelphi University because my, which is on Long Island, it's a private uh, college, a liberal arts college on Long Island, because my goal was I wanted to teach history in high school. And I spent two years there, did rather well, graduated, and there were no jobs for history in high school. And then I also had to face the draft because it was back in in that day when you were dealing with uh, Vietnam and you were dealing with the draft. And Bob, you know this well, uh, the first year of the draft that was announced on national TV on radio, and you were selected based upon your birth date in a random fashion. And I remember that night listening to the birthdays going and going and going. And the general feeling was if your number was greater than 150, the chance of you being drafted was low. So the goal of I'm sure every kid in the United States my age was listening to this, hoping that they were they were higher than 150. Well, as luck would have it, I was number 86 and it didn't take them two weeks to get me down, to get my draft physical. Fortunate or unfortunate, depending on how you look at it, I failed and I became 4F. And so I had no job. I graduated college. I couldn't get a job teaching. And then what do I do? So I continued working full-time so I can earn money and pay for my life. 
And then I was literally in a bar one night, the Salty Dog on Long Island. And I was just sitting there and I shook up a conversation with this gentleman. And he said, what do you do? And I kind of explained, well, I don't know because I, I don't have a job. I don't have a, a job. I, I, I couldn't get a job teaching. And he happened to be the director of a speech pathology audiology program on Long Island at Nassau uh, County Hospital. And he explained what it was. And he said, why don't you just come on down and see what we do and maybe it might interest you. And I did. I went literally the next day and I, I observed for the full day and it really was exciting. And so I did a little research and found out the same university that I graduated with my bachelor's degree had a master's degree in audiology and speech pathology. I applied, lucky enough to get a scholarship. But interestingly, it was in speech pathology. And it was with an emphasis in a phaseology. And so I got into the program as a speech pathologist. And like a lot of guys and women who went into audiology, who started in speech pathology, speech pathology didn't exactly do it. And so it didn't take me but a half a semester to figure out speech pathology and particularly a phaseology where the goal was not to improve, but to maintain was not where I wanted to go. And I was really, really fortunate in that one of the faculty members was Roy Sullivan, who was the senior faculty member in audiology. And we took a liking to each other. He took me under his wing. I did an internship at his hospital, Long Island College Hospital, did well. And then I was talking to uh, Dr. Sullivan saying, you know, I really, really, really like audiology. I enjoy education. I really don't want to work. What would you suggest? And he said, Mike, you know, you should think about going on for a Ph.D., and it never really entered my mind until that point. And I did a little research and I asked him, well, where should I go? What would be the best programs? And he said, Mike, the best programs currently are the Big Ten in the Midwest. Now, Bob, when you grow up in New York, you think the world begin and ends with New York City. Yeah. And I've I understood no that from people that have been there and and and, yeah. and 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 I might just interject here, Mike. That, yeah. Uh, Dr. Sullivan was for for those of you out there in, uh, listening to us. Um, Dr. Sullivan uh, is the person that set up the American Academy of Audiology for their URL, which is audiology.org. So uh, that's a, another one of the many legacies of uh, Dr. Roy Sullivan. Uh, and, yeah. and and it appears to me that you are one of those legacies <laughs> as well, Mike. So here we go. <laughs> so so I, I did some research and he said the Big Ten. Well, first of all, I didn't even know what the Big Ten was. So I had to do research on that. And, you know, back in those days, you didn't have a computer. And the only way you found out is you went to the library, you did some research. And so what I did is I applied to all of the Big Ten universities. And I don't even remember why. I think it was because John O'Neill was at the University of Illinois and Willard Zemlin. And those were two gentlemen that I read their text while I was doing my master's degree. And I was accepted and I went there and uh, my 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 family went out with me. And again, as a New Yorker, you don't know where Illinois is. And I remember distinctly thinking it was on the West Coast. And during a break, I'll go to the beach. And then so we're driving out there. You'll appreciate this. And we're looking for seagulls and there are no seagulls in <laughs> Illinois. And then, and then it kind of dawns, on, you know, we're not on the West Coast here. And so I went to University of Illinois. I did not have a scholarship in the first semester. So what I did was I sold my car. I worked from midnight to uh, eight o'clock in the morning dispensing gas at a gas station and then went to the beach during the day and accumulated enough money to pay for that first semester at the University of Illinois. And then I was fortunate enough to have John O'Neill take me under his wing and I got a scholarship for the rest of my time, two and a half more years at the University of Illinois. I truly uh, loved the University of Illinois. I had a great time there, learned quite a bit. I 
defended my dissertation, completed the dissertation on time, had a wonderful committee, did a dissertation on masking levels differences. And then, as you know, when you graduate from your doctoral degree, you have to look for a job. So I went back and I looked and I did research. And again, I'm from New York. And one of the jobs I was offered was at Columbia University. But interestingly enough, I also had a job uh, at Central Missouri State University, which is just uh, east of uh, Kansas City. And the salary at that place was higher than the salary uh, at Columbia. So I turned down the offer from Columbia and accepted uh, the job at Central Missouri State, which, again, is a state university uh, just uh, east of uh, Kansas City. And I just want to backtrack one little moment, you know, in my years at Illinois, aside from all of my experiences academically, I met my wife, Maureen, uh, there, and uh, we ended up, as you know, getting married later on. Uh, and she, Maureen grew up in the St. Louis area in Alton, Illinois. So I knew sometime o- along the line, I would have to get a job that's close to St. Louis and Kansas City fit the bill. So I got the job at Central Missouri State. Uh, It was a master's degree program in audiology and speech pathology. Taught six different courses over the six years I was there. Uh, Supervised the clinic two days a week and did committee work and all those lovely things. Had a great faculty, great students, modern new clinic at that time. And then in my sixth year, I was up for promotion to an associate level. And you've you've been in academia. You know this story I'm about to tell. Uh, you may very well be uh, approved for it or in consideration for it, but there are other people who are there before you, and there's a certain allotment on who gets and who doesn't get. And unfortunately, the year that I went up, uh, I was not in that allotment, although the dean said, you know, Mike, You really deserve it, but this is the reality. We only have so many available slots, and you were not in the queue. Well, that kind of got me a little upset because I thought, you know, it should be based upon what you've earned over those years and not based upon some queue. And so I got a little ticked off, and I, I looked at other positions, and I accepted a position at the Veterans Administration Hospital in Omaha, Nebraska. Love the VA, but absolutely despised Omaha, Nebraska. I mean, I don't mind cold, but when it's negative 80 degrees of the wind chill, that's a little bit past my upper limit of comfort. And then doing that for two out of three years we were there, it didn't take long for Maureen and I to say, you know, and Maureen had a great job. She was working at Boys Town in the vestibular lab with Dave Sear. And so she had a wonderful job there in Omaha. And I was at the VA. Uh, we enjoyed, you know, the camaraderie that we had with Boys Town and the VA. But living in negative 80 degrees just was not going to last very long. And it was further away from St. Louis. So I looked for a job that was in a warmer climate and ended up in Atlanta, Georgia, through the VA. Loved Atlanta, loved the VA, but again, I'm getting further away from uh, St. Louis. And I was there one year, and a job opened up at the University of Missouri in Columbia. Took that job, knowing that it was going to be temporary, because while I was there, I was fortunate enough to be approached by Margot Skinner who, as you know, is internationally known for her work on hearing aids and later on in cochlear implants. And there was an opening at Children's Hospital to direct the Children's Hospital uh, audiology program. And I was invited by Margo to interview. I got there, I interviewed, and Margo was a very, very, very wise young lady. And she said, Mike, pediatric audiology is not for you. I mean, it's just not going to work out. And I knew it but I was hoping to get closer to St. Louis. And she said, however, there is going to be a job opening in a year for my position. She was director of audiology in the adult section because we're going to be opening up a brand new program in cochlear implants. And when that becomes available, I will contact you. So I was at the University of Missouri and 
true to her word, Margot contacted me uh, if I would be interested in coming in to interview for the position of director of audiology at Washington University. And I, I accepted the invitation. I went for the interview. It was only two people, Margot and John Fredrickson, who was the chair of the department. And John relied almost exclusively on the recommendation of Margot. But I do remember sitting in his office and him saying to me, Mike, I think you're well qualified for this position, but in order for you to maintain your position, you're going to have to demonstrate two things. One is you're going to have to develop much greater research than what you currently have. And up to that point, I only had one article in a peer-reviewed journal, and that was way back when. And you're going to have to demonstrate that you'll manage the program so that it's profitable. Can you do that? And I said, oh, sure. You know, <laughs> and mind you, I at that point, I had absolutely no training in administration, no training in anything related to business. I didn't even know what black and red meant. I didn't know what profit. I, I knew nothing about business at all, but I knew that I wanted to be in St. Louis and I knew that I could be successful at this job. So I went back to Columbia, told Maureen about this. It took me three months to accept the position. And Margo was incredibly patient about that. And the reason I had questions about it, because I was in Columbia in a academic environment that required me to do nothing but show up each day and teach a class and to do the clinic. And I could have done that for the rest of my life and been happy as a frog on a lily pad, as opposed to Washington University with now this thing hanging over my head of publishing, which again, I only had one article at that point and running a successful department financially and it, it administering nine people. I had none of those experiences, but yet, I accepted the position. Long story short, was there for 34 years, learned the business part along the way. And in all the years that I was there, our department was in uh, the black every single year, except for 2008 when everything crashed. And then 2020, when, of course, we had the pandemic. So my... Um, the message I would like to, to give somebody who might be watching this is here I was in a situation where the prospect was daunting in terms of could you actually physically do this and what would happen to you if you failed? Do you just take the easy step and stay where you are that you knew you were going to be successful for the rest of your life or do you take the challenge and do it? And I decided to take the fork towards the challenge and do it. And it was the best decision I ever made. Not to say that along the way I didn't stumble because Lord knows I stumbled. But I was fortunate enough to have people who supported me when I stumbled. And I was smart enough not to make the same mistake twice. And that's, well, it's, that's it's one of those things that that uh, if you're if you're always challenged to some degree, uh, it, it, it tends to really change the way you look at the profession and the way you look at yourself, as well as colleagues and all kinds of things. Uh, doing the same thing all the time, uh, I think people find as ideology is a great profession, but at that time, and it, it, we were practicing about the same time, to do exactly the same thing every day and talk about the same courses that you all do every day, well, that, that gets just a little bit boring when you're a period of time. And, but the challenges are what always interested uh, a lot of us to kind of rise to another occasion or do something we don't know anything about and try to find something about it. Uh, so no, I, I, I totally uh, think that this was not only for you, but for our profession, it was a great move on your part. Yeah, and, it, and, and you know, and there were so many wonderful things that came making that move. I was thirty-four years of working with incredibly talented audiologists that I 
that are hired along the way, building new clinics. I, you know, I, I, I actually built two brand new clinics, you know, the, the, the plans for the clinic, the booths, I mean, new equipment, new staff, new procedures, working with an incredibly talented group of physicians and a large variety of professional areas, meeting people around the world doing research, meeting people at AAA working on the, you know, the, the meetings, working on task force. It, it just, it really just expanded uh, the challenges and each challenge was better than the one before. Yeah. Um well, and and you also were involved with the Central Institute for the Deaf as well during that time. Yep. Mm-hmm. And now C- CID literally was l- across the street. And it's, okay. when I got there, it was uh, a master's degree program in audiology. And in my role there was to teach the amplification courses to the master's degree students and then also to uh supervise the students that want the clinical practice from CID. And then, as you know, the field went to the AUD. And at that point, CID was headed by Brad Stack. And Brad was wonderful in that uh, the initial reaction on the part of the people at uh, CID was not to pursue the uh, the AUD, shut down and program completely. And Brad saw you know, the history of CID, the AUD, and he literally built the entire program from scratch. And it, I was invited to be part of the committee to to develop it, but Brad really was the person who did it. And I continued my teaching of the amplification course in the AUD program uh, almost to the time that I retired. And we continue to take interns and externs from the AUD program. We supervised capstone projects. Uh, we did everything where I taught a course one semester on the business aspects of audiology. We arranged for the students to observe surgery. There was just an enormous amount of interaction between the medical school where I was and CID, which was across the street. Well, and you had a huge hearing aid research laboratory there at Washington University from what from what I've understood, from what I understand, and from some of the papers I've seen, and so on. So, uh, yeah, we uh, we were fortunate. My 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 initial contract, my contact on that was really through Starkey, uh, Jerry Rosisco, and he was the head of research at Starkey, and he literally helped me build a research laboratory and also hire a full time audiologist to be an associate in the research lab. And as time went on. The projects got bigger and bigger and bigger and more more number of projects. We were the first in the country to install in our space, as you know, which is an eight loudspeaker array through the help of Larry Revit. And I did research uh, with a, a large number of hearing aid manufacturers, uh, battery manufacturers, ear mold labs. Uh, I mean, everything and anything. And what was important about that to me was, number one, how do you go about doing that and then being successful at it and then doing IRBs and and all those things that are associated with research projects. But the thing that was critically important to me when I created these protocols and I created uh, these, these budgets in combination with the sponsor, one thing became absolutely clear on both sides of the discussion was if we were to engage in research with your product and we find that the results are not favorable to your product or shows no significant difference from the control, that will be published. And if we can come to that agreement, we cannot engage in a clinical uh, study. So for the 34 years that I was at WashU creating, I don't know, a little under a million dollars worth of uh, income to do these studies, I always maintained the independence from the sponsoring uh, manufacturer that we set the protocol, we negotiated the protocol, we agreed upon the protocol, but we always agreed that we were going to do a project that was going to be publishable. And when it was published, it will stand on its own regardless of the outcome in favor or not in favor of your particular product. And just to emphasize that point, 
one of the projects we did was the first version, one of the first versions of digital signal processing, where everybody thought this was this was it. This was going to solve all the problems related to sound quality and speech intelligibility and quiet and noise and all these other issues. And we found out that the performance of the linear version of the hearing aid and the digital version of the hearing, aid, there were no significant differences. Uh, there was an improvement in sound quality, but there was no uh, improvement in performance. And we published it. And Widex at that point made no attempt to stop us from publishing it because we had this agreement. The results are the results are the results. You know, and and that's why Macintosh still survives very well making analog amplifiers that sell for thirty grand or so. And <laughs> uh, uh, and and the other thing is, this was at a time when when ethical practice uh, things for research mm-hmm. were only kind of figments of, of of the minds like yourself and and, and research colleagues. Uh, it wasn't cast in stone as it was as it is currently. Both mm-hmm. in the ASHA code as well as in the AAA code, and and I, and I also we call it as some very on ABA code. So yeah, this was a uh, innovative kind of a thing for manufacturers. They all expected that their stuff was going to be better than everybody else's, and and of course none of us wanted to hear that as clinicians. <laughs> we wanted to know what was going to work and what wasn't going to. work. And, and, and you know, and you know, that in, in working with manufacturers, and I understand this, they want to. Some of them want to kind of manipulate the protocol so that the results will favor their product, and it gets to be a tussle to you know to, to negotiate this thing. No, we can't do that. You know, th- this is what we have to do. And there was more than one project I had to say no, thank you, because. The, the suggestion for the protocol clearly was designed to enhance whatever product we were we were investigating at the time. The other thing that was nice about all of this research, it in, got involved the staff in the research. And that led to, you know, not every audiologist is interested in research. And when I hired audiologists, I would say, if you're interested in research, we do it. If you're not interested that's okay because you'll have the ability to teach and you'll have the ability to practice best practice. But I had at least six audiologists who worked with me and you know, this you're working with them and you're saying, you know, you're a wonderful audiologist, but you need to consider going beyond this. You need to consider pursuing a PhD so that you can add to the the base of knowledge in the field, because being a clinician is wonderful, but you should be beyond that. And I had six audiologists who were wonderful audiologists, or I'm proud to say, went on and successfully pursued uh, their PhD. And that I could not have done if I stayed at Central Missouri State University yep, or at right. University of Missouri. And that was one of the other nice things that was about, you know, being at Washington University. And as you know, because you've done this, when you're doing research that you're doing, you get invited to speak at a lot of different national and international meetings. And I had the pleasure of going to almost every state in the United States and a lot of countries abroad in in presenting some of the ideas. I also was invited by AAA to create, to be the chair, if you will, of two task forces to create two national best practice guidelines uh, dealing with one, dispensing hearing aids to the adult population. And the second one, was dispensing bone anchor devices to patients with unilateral hearing loss. And I also did a task force with ASHA on uh, dispensing hearing aids to the adult population. But the one that I did with AAA was wonderful in the sense, you know, when you do it, when you do a task force, you have to select people to be on the task force. That's one of your charges that being. So I, I, I recruited a lot of who I thought were wonderful people, uh, Todd Ricketts, Darcy Benson, uh, Dave Citron, and you go on and on. But the best one for me was Harvey Abrams uh, from, from Florida, because he's the one who taught me evidence-based practice. And he said, you know, Mike, you did this other one for ASHA. It's okay. But... 
if you want me on your task force, rather than making recommendations like you did for ASHA, every recommendation we make has to be based upon the evidence, not just because you think it's the right thing to do. And then if you go through that process, you'll find the things that we don't have evidence for. And that will be part of the task force is to highlight we have these recommendations. It's anecdotal. We think it's going to the right thing to do, but we have no evidence to really support that recommendation. And it was just an absolutely wonderful experience. And I believe it was the first best practice guideline that made recommendations not because it seemed to be the right thing to do clinically, like really or measures, but there was evidence to support what it is you were recommending and then opened up areas that we think this is the right thing to do, but there's really no evidence to support that. You know, though, here, here's a guy who started off with, you know, one peer reviewed article. Uh, now, by now, you had 44 uh, peer-reviewed articles out of 102 total or so. Uh, we, we're we're not sure how many have come since that time, but <laughs> there's a number of those. Uh, and and the other thing, when you talk about national and international presentations, it isn't just one or two or or one here and one there. It's 345 national and international presentations combined. So so when when you, uh, you you speak very humbly about those things, Mike, but but honestly, as one of our giants, 345 national international presentations are quite quite a few, as well as the publication. And and in addition to that, uh, you have uh, like 29 book chapters. Hopefully, there may be another one in your future here soon. Anyway, but uh, but but also a number of textbooks as well that you were involved with. And and I don't know, I think I count about uh, 10 or so or more. You, and if you're like me, you remember every single one of those and all the <laughs> headaches that went with it. Uh, so, uh, but fabulous uh, publication record and educated a whole lot of us in a lot of areas where we, where we needed that extra little push of best practice and some of those kinds of things. And, so um, were there some of those books that were harder than others to put together? They're all hard. As you know, yes, you've done right. this. Yes. Before. <laughs> They're yeah, exactly. all hard. You know, you, you, as you know, you know, you, you, you're, you're approached by a publisher. Uh, are you interested in doing a book? And who says no? I mean, it's like a, a wonderful thing to do. And then you've got to figure out, OK, now, what's the timeline for this? When, when, you know, what's the timeline? And then you have to kind of break it down into chapters and then kind of you, you do it linearly. Like uh, we do we do, on the book on uh, audiology, you know, patient history, audiometric exam, masking, speech pathology, speech audiometry, admittance and so on and so on and so on. So you think about the organization in a linear fashion and then you select, OK, who are you going to invite to see if they're interested in doing this? And that, as you know, is a challenge in itself. And then once you have somebody who agrees to do it or more than one author to do it, you have to be sure that they understand the guidelines, you know, the author guidelines. And you know this, how many authors say, yeah, we're going to write this for you. They don't pay attention to the guidelines. It's like they never received the guideline. It's kind of like, OK, it's due in May, March 15th. March 15th comes and goes. You have nothing. You contact the person. Oh, yeah, this came up. That came up. It'll be June. And, I, you know, I, you, you've done this. I've done this. Uh, you know, there's, you can cite an example where you got a chapter where you had to basically write it because it would take too much time to get somebody else to do it. And or you had. Thank God that didn't happen very often. It was so poorly written that you just simply have to say, this is just not going to work. And then you just cut it out. Right. Well, <clears throat> and, and that's how you make enemies who never talk to you again. <laughs> um, and so and then the thing about it is you do all this work and you know this. And I keep saying, you know, this because you've done this before. Your financial reward is like next to nothing. But you get so much satisfaction in 
producing this from scratch, working with these marvelous people in the United States and around the world, and then publishing it. And then it now becomes a body of evidence for your field. And then you leave that behind when you're pushing daisies. Uh, I mean, it, it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful experience. And I was fortunate enough to do, I think it was 14 or 16 of these things. And each one is, and as you, as you do more and more and more, you get better at it. Uh, but it's a lot of work. And if you're doing it for money, this is not the field in which to do it. But it's just a wonderful experience. Well, one of the few things that that sometimes happens with with publications is that you may end up with a couple extra gigs because of it, and sometimes those you can almost make uh, th those don't pay big bucks either. But a lot of times you make more on that than you do off the textbook as well. Uh, anyway, so but the other thing too is you, you've been a, quite a journal editor also, Mike, and. Uh, I mean, trends and amplification from 96 to 2000, the Journal of the American Academy of Audiology, uh, still an, uh, an editor for that publication, uh, International Journal of Audiology, seminars and hearing, uh, and actually a, a, a contributor to the hearing, the Canadian Hearing Report. A lot of us know Marshall relatively well, who's the editor of that, and uh, and recruits heavily from a lot of other things that all of us do here in the United States. But uh, yeah, again, there's a lot of those experiences. Are, are there some of those that stand out more than others or less than others, those kinds of things? Now, the, the, the transient amplification was interesting because this was from a, this was from Team A Medical Publish, and they asked me to create a brand new journal. And it became trends and amplification. And then I did that for, I don't know, five or eight years. And then I passed it along to Todd Ricketts and he became editor for a while. Mm -hmm. And that was, that was a wonderful experience because each, each edition was a specific topic and then uh, recruiting people for that topic. And again, anytime you do that kind of editing thing, you get to get, you get to meet people from around the world that you never would ordinarily have, have met. And you get to know different writing styles and different personalities. It just adds more to your life than you could possibly imagine than just saying, yes, I'll start a new journal and begin that process. But the other thing that was interesting to me when I was the uh, associate editor in amplification for the JAAA, uh, Jim Jergo was the was the editor and he was a wonderful person to work with. And. I remember when I was, you know, I was reviewing articles off, not always, but many, many times, my length of my review was bigger than the actual volume of the article, because I really believed in getting into the depth. Did they, did they answer the question, was statistical analysis correct, was the, was the formatting correct? And I spent a lot of time on that. And I remember one time Jim Jurgis said to me, Mike, when you edit, your goal is not to protect the author. Your goal is to protect the reader. And that was a valuable lesson for me in that what what ends up in publication is, for lack of a better word, the truth. And, and as you know now, uh, back in those days, you had to have at least three reviewers for each submitted article. And later on in my career, uh, it ended up being sometimes two reviewers. And as you know, you've been a reviewer. Sometimes the reviews are wonderful, a lot of suggestions. And others, a simple sentence, looks fine to me. And you sit back and you say, hmm, how did that happen? So the goal is to get reviewers who take it seriously with the goal being that whatever ends up in print is the best possible version of that particular manuscript. Yeah, the hard part, I, I, I will never forget, of course, you never forget the first time you submit an article and it comes back with most more red ink on it than it has uh, black ink. And, uh, uh, and, talking about a learning experience for a young person trying to publish, get something published. Um, that was a rude, rude awakening, but, but a very good one. Oh yeah. I remember that. Ver 
I remember that very well. Getting back my first submitted article with, uh, I mean, well, you know, three reviews. I just like, oh, my God, it was horrible. I thought this was like a masterpiece. I thought this was a Picasso. And then it comes <laughs> back with all of these things. And then I was taught early on, when you get that review and you're shocked by it, put it down. Don't look at it for a week. Go back to it. Reread the comments. And it's not going to be nearly as stabbing as the original reaction to it. And I, I learned that. But I mean, all along my career in submitting these articles and getting reviews, even my, my, my I can remember my last article that I submitted a few years ago also had a lot of negative comments. And every, I've never, I have never in all of my years in submitting manuscripts for publication ever got anything that said, except as is. I mean, I never came even close to that as the best I ever had was except but with minor revisions, but most of them were except with major revisions or out and out reject. So well, there's too many, too many egos involved, I think, to, to with some some of that. Yeah. But but there are some serious editors, and those are the ones that that probably gave you the review, uh, except with minor revisions. Um, yeah. And uh, but there's a whole lot of egos involved, and a whole lot of different things going on, different ways of looking at topics and all these things. And and the nice thing about that is all of that, as as you know from from all your experience as an editor, you take all of those things and put them together, and and as you say, it comes out a lot better for the profession, a lot better of science and so on. Um, and then the other thing I learned is if you're going to be a researcher, develop a thick skin. Oh, yeah. Same with forensic, the same with forensic Uh About the time <laughs> you sit for a cross examination and you're fried, uh, you walk out with your with a with all burned up, and then you come back and your skin's a little thicker, and they don't yeah. fry you quite as bad. And that's the same, <laughs> I'm, I'm sure, with the with the, yeah. with the yeah. journal situation. But you've had editors awards, uh, audiologist of the year awards. Uh, a lot of number of things like that, and and uh, and you know you mentioned your research with the with the battery manufacturers. It sounds like you almost were one of those one of their original Energizer bunnies for a <laughs> period of time too. So, but but what I what I think we where we want to we want to move our discussion, Mike, is to uh, a couple things. You've been uh, the 2014 Distinguished Achievement Award at the American Academy of Audiology. That had to be quite an quite an quite an honor for a for a guy who had that kind of a, of an inspirational start, and uh, as well as the presidential award from the American Academy of Audiology. Um, so that so with with all of the, yeah, I'm sure you have some things to say about those. Uh, so yeah, what's interesting about on the pre the presidential award. I knew absolutely nothing about that. And I was, Maureen was the, Maureen and Robert Sweeto were involved. Robert Sweeto approached Maureen about, you know, doing this. And Maureen kept it quiet. And I was at the General Assembly, didn't have any idea what was going on. And then it was announced that I got up there. I mean, I was flabbergasted. Uh, it took me, it took me a second or two to recover and then walk up and accept the award. And then on the award that I got uh, later on in my life from the, the AAA, uh, that was spearheaded by Francis Cook. That one I knew about in advance, and I had to uh, present, you know, like a, a little speech, an acceptance speech for the award. And that was really hard. I, I, at that point, I've done hundreds of presentations to small audiences and very, very large audiences. And that one was really hard because – it was it was about me and i'm very un, i'm very uncomfortable talking about me but i so i tried to keep it you know less than 2 minutes and but that was a that was a wonderful wonderful evening uh at a dinner and the thing is like like this big it weighs a ton and they mail it to you later on oh, and yeah. it, it's i don't know if you can see it but it's right yeah. behind my my no, back I, here I have one of those from being the chair yeah, they, of the they, certification they board. Yeah. yeah, those things are you don't want to you don't want to hit anybody with it because you'll kill yeah. it. And yeah, uh, well, I think from from your perspective, Mike, um, 
where would you see the future of audiology uh, with all your your vast experience, publications, honors, and and research experience, and all these different things? Where would you see the future of our profession uh, in, here in at the end of 2023? Thank you for asking that question, because I've given that a considerable amount of thought. As you probably, as you do know, as from the time you started on audiology until now, there have been numerous occasions of disruptive technology that at the time, everybody thought this was end of audiology as we knew it. And did I get into the right field? And every one of those things ended up being no big deal. And then recently, you know, you've had uh, OTC and the initial reaction to that was this is the end of audiology as we know it. And I, 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 I did some research and almost instantaneously I figured out this was going to have no significant negative impact on audiology. In fact, it's going to be a positive thing. And I've done presentations about that. So and then there was a. Uh, you know, the pandemic where everything just shut down and people lost their jobs and so on and so forth. And healthcare was one of the professions that flourished and actually did just fine. So for somebody who's watching this and considering getting into audiology as a profession, I think the golden years are ahead. As you know, there's a shortage of audiologists. As you know, there's a high attrition of audiologists. So there always will be employment of audiologists. And as me as an example, getting into the door is just the beginning. And you do with it what you want. You do with it what you can. You accept the challenges along the way or you take the easy way, if you will. And you'll have a very fine uh a very fine uh, career. It's it's a wonderful career. Salaries are improving. Uh, the doctoral degree has improved the standing of audiologists. So I think the future of the career is bright. I have no qualms about that. I see the day in the not too distant future where audiologists will be more autonomous with third party reimbursers than they are right now. Uh, you won't need a referral from a physician to get an audiometric exam. You can go directly to an audiologist to get the exam. I'm hoping that in time, audiologists will be better managers of third party reimbursement to make it more lucrative, more profitable, more easy to navigate than what they seem to be doing right now in many, many areas. I think artificial intelligence has to have some kind of impact on diagnostics and some kind of impact on amplification. And it already is being instituted in a large number of amplification schemes going forward in terms of noise reduction and decision making. I can see the day when there may very well be a pharmaceutical answer to curing deafness. And I know that there are several manufa drug manufacturers working on that right now where it is conceivable. Uh, I'll be pushing daisies by the time this happens where, you know, uh, you could find a cure for deafness and hair cell regrowth. Uh, I mean, I, I could see a, an issue with that. And then there are other things that audiologists can get into that's just beyond diagnostics and amplification and cochlear implants. Because think about it. When you and I first got in the field, we did diagnostics and we did hearing aids. And in the time that we've been in this field, we've added cochlear implants. We've added electrophysiology. We've added vestibular evaluation. We've added uh, bone anchor devices and new, new avenues of treatment will open up to audiologists going forward that we, you and I will not be aware because we were not aware of that when we entered the field many, many years ago. So audiology is always going to be a profession that's going to evolve. And then the question is, as an individual, how are you acceptance to change? How do you modify yourself to that change? And let me give you an example. When OTC came around two years ago, I decided 
I needed to incorporate it into my practice and not make believe it didn't happen. And there are a lot of different steps that went in that direction. And I just didn't say, well, we're not going to do that. And how do you incorporate cochlear implants into your practice? How do you incorporate vestibular into your practice? So it's all these new things that are coming at you is how adaptable are you to accept that change and how how willing are you to work? How willing are you to work to make that change successful? Or are you just going to say, no, I'm not going to get into this. It's just too much work. And you get, you know, it gets down to the individual personality, much like my personality when I was offered the job at Washington University. Do I take the cushy path or do I take the challenging path? You have a hundred audiologists, 90 might have. 90 might have might have taken the cushy patch and 10 might have taken the challenging part. It's taking the challenging part that separates you from the group. Yes. And uh, and 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 one of the things that is one of those biggest factors, Mike, is the idea that you need to have that thick skin we talked about just a little while ago, where um, where in case something doesn't work. Well, then you go back and you regroup and you try it again, or you go back and regroup and do it just a different way. And uh, now, before, before before we before we kind of terminate our discussion here, Mike, it's just been fabulous. Uh, uh, I always ask the the giants, "What's your coolest moment to date uh, relative to uh, your profession and those kinds of things?" Uh, I think we all have some of those things that you'll just never forget that was was the coolest moment. But I always say to date, because most of us, I mean, I think I've retired from three different uh, audiology jobs in my career. And and I know that many of my colleagues have done the same thing uh, or, 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 or something similar. So there's going to be things that will come later than now, of course. But uh, what's the coolest thing that uh, has... Uh, has been part of your career to do? Well, I actually come to think of three things. Uh, mm. uh, three. Uh, one was the, the biggest was meeting my future wife at the University of Illinois. That was the most coolest thing of my entire life was that. And then that, of course, led to a wonderful marriage, uh, two daughters and three grandchildren. And there's nothing cooler than that. I mean, that is like the height of coolness. The second one, not nearly as important, was winning, or not winning, but getting the award from AAA of my lifetime of work. I didn't expect that. I got it. I, it was just a wonderful, because that's kind of like the eruption of the volcano. I mean, it doesn't get any better than that. You, you know, it's, you can't go any better than that. And then the third one, we gets back to how I started at Washington University, it's kind of like the train going up the hill. You can do it, you can't do it, you can't do it, you can't do it. Going into a position that knowingly I did not have the background, but saying, I think I can do it and I'm willing to take the chance and being there for 34 years and in the 34 years building a nationally and internationally recognized program and then fulfilling the number one thing that john Fredrickson said to me when i was hired be profitable and in the 34 years that i was there again coming from somebody who had no idea i didn't know anything about business doing that and learning things along the way and being profitable for 32 out of 34 years that's the other cool thing that i did along with, I mean, if you're profitable and you got a horrible program and you're miserable, that's not a big deal. But to be profitable, be happy in your job, have a wonderful staff. As you and I both know, you can be a giant in audiology and I can be a giant in audiology, but we're not giants if we don't have a root system of people helping us along the way. And I was really... Yeah, I was really fortunate to have a lot of people along the way that if I didn't have their support, and a lot of multitude of ways, you and I wouldn't be talking today. Well, uh, I, I hope that uh, that our group out there has learned from our discussion today, Mike, 
uh, that that no matter where a person starts in their career, uh, it's a lot of hard work to get to a certain place. And then you continue to do hard work because it's just like that uh, that uh, that football player that starts off in the Pee Wee group. Well, then he graduates to the next level and they got to show himself all over again. Mm-hmm. Then you go to the next level, uh, maybe high school. Then you go to the college and, you, and every time you have to prove yourself and if you continue to prove yourself then you go on into the nfl which mm-hmm. is where most of our giants find themselves i think these days wonderful so, analogy and and uh so so today my guest has been uh dr michael Valente, professor emeritus department of Laryngology, washington university school of medicine from St. Louis, Missouri, a true inspirational giant in audiology. Thank you for tuning in this week uh, to This Week in Hearing. And uh, thanks, Mike, for for all your comments and and sharing this unique experience uh, in becoming a true giant in audiology. Bob, thank you so much for the invitation. This has been a wonderful hour or so in just shooting the breeze and talking about (laughs) and 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 the breeze has the breeze has blown us uh, quite a professional. And thanks again for being with us. Thank you again.